the world that was. It is cold. Plumes of white fog escape my mouth as I pant. My throat is hoarse, my lungs are fire. I snatch at air like a miser. They are gaining on me. Understandable, but still, not my optimal outcome. Hope for the best and plan for the worst, they say. Well, life was good, so lamentably. I always did more of the former. I hoped for the best. I ignored the slowly changing winds. I ignored the growing signs. Like a workhorse, I blinkered myself from what I knew would spook me if I eyed it dead on. And I lost track. So I lost everything. Everything. The winds rose, slowly by slowly, day by day, like a crab in water. I did not see the cauldron I was sitting in was slowly boiling over. And our village was in its center. We were the crab. I was one of the few. We hid it well in our line. Only the oldest families of the village knew the secret. Most thought it an old wife's tale, used by our lads to gain greater chances, and our ladies to scare their menfolk. But it was true. We could feel the winds. We knew much more than we let on. For it was a hated thing to know what we knew, to be who we were. Those who knew. We knew of the winds of magic. We knew of the ways to bend and form it. And we knew of the ways of the enemy, the Dark Ones. But it availed me naught, nothing. A hundred generations of accumulated knowledge, and it failed, or I did. Perhaps the fault was mine alone. As I said, I ignored the signs. The crops blighted, the stillborn cars, the stones that bled. The winds, the increase in their force, the direction it blew. Forever it blew from the north, always the north. And I should have known, but I ignored it. I said each day, tomorrow, it will change, it will abate. It will blow anew from another cardinal. But it did not. So when they came, I was not ready. A thunderous crack resounded in the night. All awoke. We rushed outside. A small stockade of some ten feet. They pushed it down. We did not even know of their advent. They had crept through the night. Such carnage. Such horror. The forces of the Grandfather. Nurgle. I saw men and women transformed into mushrooms spouting atrocities in seconds. Scabrous blades dripping bile, the sickened all it touched, animal crop, tree or man. They butchered. They were proof to the blades of our swords, ignorant to the need to die, even when skewered on pikes. I fled. I fled into my home. I barred the door and then backed away from it, lurking in the dark, stiff, childishly paralyzed, as if any movement might draw their attention. I even held my breath. Then it happened. I was not prepared. I shuddered as the door itself changed. It grew a ruddy face out of the knots of the oaken slab. A voice from the earth intoned jauntily. You know they are coming through every door here. Noise or no. All. I stared at it in slack-jawed terror. What will you do? What are you? Not what. Who? It intoned. And I instantly knew. It can be from no other. My mind ablaze with instant potentials, instant fears, doubts, memories, second-hand terror. All swept away as it again spoke. You have my attention for only so long. I knew.
He offers me a pact, but because of who I am, he does not wish to be gauche. Why now? You need me. But why now? What can you do for me that is worth my soul, my damnation? What do you gain? Satisfaction. It is a puzzle. If you ask for that which you need, then you shall receive it. If you ask for that which you do not need, then my assistance will end. Ah, I know thee. Your first answer hides the truth. You wish to use me as cat's board against the worshippers of the Grandfather. Do not deny it. Its eyes seem to glitter. I deny nothing. You are running out of time. Then that is what I shall have. Time. Beware, mortal. To us, time is an ocean. To your kind, it is a river. You would not do well to attempt to travel upstream to the source. Then I shall have time from now, alone, here. Freeze my home in time, so I may ponder. The door then seemed to incline its knots to show it looked down and then up again. I shuffled slowly to the window, avoiding all light coming in that may show my movement. I peeked around the curtain, and there it was. The sack of my village in portrait. Nothing moved. I slowly took in the vista, elongating this moment, knowing that when I turned around, I would again be sparring with it. But I had to keep it entertained or so, or I was dead. As dead as my village. It was too late. There could be nothing now but revenge. I backed away from the window and looked at the face in the door. At it. What now? It purred at me. I have a question about the terms. You gain my devotion as a given. You are entertained if I am smart enough. But how far can I ask? Astute. You can imagine my largesse to match an amount. You would then describe how much of my gift you wish to use on any one thing. For fairness, you should know that if you ask for this place to be cut totally from time, you would overstep your mark. I would leave insulted. But if you ask for as far as an extension as possible, then you would gain centuries at the least. Then you will simply vanish when all of your gift is used? That depends on the spectacle. Entertain me. I give a small incline of my head, then twist and pace. I think. My training is such that it is possible at all. But I am in it now. I must play to win. Only if you trick the trickster will he give you your due. I must be clever. Ish. As far as I am able. I am no college mage. I am but a knower of things. What does he want? Why? What can I get from this? I stop and turn on it. Stock still, I take the final step. I have my requests. Excellent. I practically gave you the first one, so try not to disappoint me. I wish for a magnification of my power, but I then hold up a finger. And? One year. Here. No need of food or sleep or any bodily functions. The old oak face shifted into the beginnings of a sneer. Got him, thinks I. Nothing else? A polite chat about it afterwards before you go. Answer three questions, eh? The knots moved again, twisting into a more quizzical look. But it seemed to shift back into a normal door again. It then slammed open and near off its hinges. A rush of wind slammed into the room, as a gust of wind forced itself into the room. But instead of taking me off my feet and into the wall... I rise as it surrounded me and tears through me, leaving traces of itself behind. 
I was held up and buffeted by the winds for what felt like hours. Finally, I was gently deposited back onto the ground, my feet stepping onto the rushes and my eyes blazing with an eldritch lambent glow. I was changed. I could feel the winds of magic suffuse me. I could feel their eddies, their slightest change of speed or direction. The door slammed shut again. I know you are still here. I slowly sat cross-legged on the floor and looked at the now blank wooden door. So, my first question in our little chat. Why were you disappointed in my choices? A wind blew and a whisper caressed my inner ear. Power is a tool, not a destination. Of course I know this, but it was necessary for us to have this little chat. The door knots now emerge again, a face appears, but it is now non-human, a hawk, I believe, but its eyes say it all. They sparkle again. My second question. You wish to use me as a cat sport against the followers of your rival, the infested ones, you think my abilities, enhanced by your gifts, can gain this result here? Their destruction? I did, and more. But now, well, you have but one question remaining. It had better be good. I nodded solemnly, a statement before my question. Our goals collide. This is the reason for your arrival, your gifts. But you waited until I had nothing left to save, so hoping my dreams would be small and myopic, the lesser rather than the greater. You had hoped to play me short, to fall upon the bandits and horrors of your enemy, then wither, spent. You took from me my choices, so I shall reclaim them. I now have the power... Your investment is clear, the vessel now worthy, and I have a year. So, my third question. Tell me how to use my newfound power to destroy all of the forces of Nurgle. The door went flat and began to violently rattle on its hinges. Then it burst out and then turned to smoke, then formed into a being in front of me. A scribe in form, cowled so its face was hidden in shadows, but its eyes were dimly lit in the midst of the obfuscation. Its grin barely visible as only its chin came out, the movement more indication of the action than vision. It also seemed to blur in and out of reality, as if a reflection of a candle light in a breeze. Touché. You do not think small. I like that. So, let us begin. And so he did. It taught me what I needed to know from the ground up. The very basics, the nature of power, its flow, its ebb, its basis and its nature. It taught me hexes, spells, curses, circles, chants, incantations and alchemy. The ever transient nature of matter of one who harnesses the steel of the ephemeral, thought and will. I knew the names of things, their core resonance, how to twist their strands connected to the winds of magic, how to change reality, and eventually, how to destroy the muttering blubber mounds of his enemy, their arch sorcerers, their mightiest princes. And when we were done, on the day that the bubble went down and time crashed back into my universe, I unleashed a full year of pent-up rage, mourning, study, horror and grief. And of course, hate. I made the land into mud and the air into knives. I shattered their spines and twisted them inside out at a flick of my wrist and a softly spoken word in a language that cannot exist. I cleansed their muck and contained their explosions, as I popped one after another of them. I purged them all individually, and at the end, 
wreathed in power. I extended my wings by showing my might to mine foe. I cleansed the entire area of their filth. Displaying the previous butchery was only for my joy. My plan long hatched. My revenge. But as always, he who laughs last, laughs longest. I thought myself so clever then. You see, I had cleansed the region, and upon this, I found that all of my mystic might was so honed as to only apply to them. Against the forces of the Grandfather, I was a scourge. To all else, nothing. And I had cleansed the region. But that meant I was the sole survivor of a massacre. A survivor with a murmured past. Few knew. But after marriages, they were not only of our village. After so long, word travelled quickly, and I fled. And now I pant, my lungs snatch at air. I have been running for so long. I am so hungry and tired. But the hounds of the Witchfinder get closer by the hour. I am unfit. I always hoped for the best. But the demon of Zinch now lasts longest. For a witch hunter is not of Nurgle. So to him, I am a fat scribe who will burn just right. Torish was always clever, but he could never leave well enough alone, always putting his nose in where it was not needed, always asking questions that left others uncomfortable, making excuses and then busying themselves with a task that permitted no further discourse. He was always unpopular with the other children, who rarely understood his strange and overly complicated rules to each and every fun endeavour. Torish was clever, in a time when being so was no boon at all. For he was a confusing child, and it was said, even his parents did not know what foul spirit had infected their boy to make him so... odd. It was a long decade for Prius and Satra, his parents, for they did not understand their wayward child any more than the rest of the village. They did not know why he asked so many damn questions, why he had to know absolutely everything, how he was always disappointed when inevitably his barrage of questions led to inescapable protestations from them both that none know these things, no one normal, you speak like a wizard, for only they know of such matters. And thus the coal was planted from which the gem would arise for it was when he was not even in his early adolescence that Torish woke one morning way before his parents, way before anyone else in his village, for he had planned it thus. And he took what resources he thought he would need. Even as a child, he knew that the staples of his sojourn would be food and water. Thus he packed a small sack, which he tied over his shoulder across his torso, and strolled out into the world. His diminutive form was easily hid, and not of the stuff for vainglorious engagements or feats of strength. So Torish travelled by day and to the side of any road. He kept hidden in secret, and avoided the fires of others who might be in the night, for he knew he would merely be returned to his parents, to his village, to his life of being an oddity. But added to that would be failure. Sir Torish would camp alone and in tiny ditches or under rocks, out of sight. He wandered until his little feet took him to the place he needed to go. For he had listened, he had truly listened to the elders and adults, and to his parents, and he had sought out all he needed to know before ere he set off. 
There was but one tower in all of this land, and it was that tower he now approached, his little shoes sodden and his clothes unkept from his weeks of travel, his nights under the stars, his stomach growling, for days ago he had finished his meager supplies. Now the Tower of the Wizard was a thing of power, built to impress and intimidate. Its central spire went up into the clouds, its dark walls seen to a glass-like effect, almost reflective. Its doors as tall as a tree, its knocker far, far above the span or reach of Torresh. So he took a rock from the side of the approach, and on the door he did bang. Once, twice, thrice it rang. He waited for a time, what seemed to him like hours, but soon enough the door did slowly creak open. A man of haggard face and bent back did advance his head beyond the portal, sniffing hard in disgust when he saw none there. So Torish cleared his throat and chirruped a halloo. The old man looked down. Lank hair, dusty clothes, his hawk-like beaked nose twitched into a sneer when he saw what was there. Yet he sighed and stood aside and opened the portal wider. Torish walked into the hall, toward the stairs, and up them without hesitation. He knew this doorman was not who he needed to meet. Forgotten by the boy, the old aide slammed the door and with muttered grumble followed the boy up the stairs. Around and up they climbed. The stairs seemed never-ending, the fall below threatening. But the stairs were wide, and Torish did not even approach the edges. He merely put his fingertips on the walls and then ran them up as he walked. Never faltering, never slowing, never hastening, Torish walked the still, grumbling old man, his shadow. The steps eventually led to doors and rooms and side entrances, yet Torish ignored them all and scaled to the top. And when there was a shimmering door before him at the summit, only then did he stop. The boy now seemed to shake, out of excitement instead of cold, it seemed, despite his sodden and bedraggled visage. The aide just sighed and made a clicking noise with his mouth, indicating the boy should get on with it, or turn around. Without further ado, Torish, who had seen no key, no knocker, no knob on this hurdle, walked straight into the door, and thus through it. Another sigh and clicked response, and the aide was beside him again. He too had walked through the door. He sneered down with a look that clearly stated he was not impressed at the boys, beginner's luck, as they continued. And the room was wide and expansive, filled with odd and amazing things, to either side of a central carpeted pathway, towards an even more impressive door. The objects were of different make, different origin, different materials all, collections of sorts, but without any rhyme or reason, and no hint to their apparent use. Torish, eyes wide with wonder, but path set by determination, ceased his surveying the oddities and strode onto the carpet toward the final door. Again, there was no key, knocker or bar, but Torish still did not walk straight toward it. He stopped. He waited and existed for a period, then put out his tiny hands. He took a step forward, but no further as he licked his fingertips and extended them again. He looked at them and took two steps back. He could feel the winds that were silent and contained but still present, winds he could feel behind the door. It was then that he stepped even further away from said door and turned to the old aide with a quizzical and annoyed look on his face. The aide has shark eyes as he then grinned down at Torish maliciously. There is no room, the boy accused. This is your tower. Would you have... The boy trailed off. Yes, the old man crooned. I would have let you drop, had you been hasty. It would have killed me. You would have killed yourself, 
Restraint is the first lesson for those who wish to wield the winds, those who wish to be wizards. Better sooner than later, if you do not have the temperament for the art, then with everything you learn you are more a danger to those around you. A wizard without restraint is an accident waiting to happen. An accident that the world may not be able to afford. I'm only ten! Yet you have made your way here alone. So you wish to be trained in the art? Or is this a social call? Torish looked up at the wizard, and then broke his stare and looked at his feet. The wizard continued. Yet intellect without wisdom is as dangerous as stupidity with authority. Age will not protect you against the blandishments of the dark forces that you will command. For if you do not command them, do not master them, then they will command you. So you are either ready for the challenges, or you are not. Which is it, Torish? The boy looked up again at the mention of a name he had not divulged. I... I am ready. I have nowhere else to go. Nowhere else I can learn. This is not true. You could have made your way to the city, any city, to train as an apprentice. You could have learned words and letters, become a member of church or castle household. You could have learned to trade, learned the most complicated of all disciplines, at the great schools of the Empire for the use of their fire tubes, the cannons. You could have gone on a myriad of pathways, trodden a multitude of roads, ended in a very different place indeed. Yet, you are here. You must be honest with yourself, Torish, if not with me. It is the power, no? The excuses, the secrets, the riddles, the cleverness of it all, the knowing of it. But as I have outlined... Cleverness can have many outlets. You chose this. To walk alone and without permission, hunted by cold and wet and hunger and danger, all to trudge to the doors of a wizard's tower. All to prove your worth to one you hope to teach you the secrets of the universe. But also, to be able to wield power the likes none in your village could ever conceive of matching to elevate yourself above the other children who were so mean to you, to prove your worth to the elders and to your own parents even. You come here out of vanity, no? Torish stepped back and turned from the old lank-haired man, so he did not see the eyes of the being widen, for he witnessed no childlike protestations or denials. The boy was pacing. He was honestly thinking about this claim. When Tarnish turned back to the wizard, he did so with a look of certainty, a scrunched and furrowed brow, his little arms crossed over his torso, and his head held high. I do not think you are right. My heart may be filled with this, but my mind is not. I did not daydream about proving them all wrong, because I did not think I would ever go back. I thought I would either die on the way or find my new home. Never did I think I would be turned away. Never did I think to return to my home village. So I say, I think you are wrong. And at that, the elderly man smirked and simply stated, We shall see then, young Torish, for it will be years of cleaning and scrubbing and fetching before ever you even approach a grimoire, let alone have me explain its contents. Still enthused? This is the first conversation of this year that I have enjoyed. I will stay. I will learn. And I will one day be a better wizard than even you. The twinkle in the eye of the older man now shone as he bowed gracefully, and a light appeared beneath his feet and swept up his body as he did so. When he stood again, he was draped in the most sumptuous of finery, the most deep of velvets. Tarish did not laugh, but his eyes widened and his smile deepened as the older man gently but firmly placed his hand on Tarish's shoulder and walked him to a door behind a large picture amidst the odd objects. 
and there they processed into his true inner sanctum. A few years passed, and Torish was now at home, truly at home. He ate with the wizard, learnt from the wizard, leant on the wizard when he was lost or tired or forlorn. He was his apprentice. Yet even with all of his training, Torish could never quite control his nature. He was still young, after all, had the exuberance of youth and the vim and verve to match. And so it was that one day he was in the basement, the true ritual site of the wizard. Covered in glyphs and wards and circles, he swept around them all day, cleaning and clearing and making it all spotless. Yet he could not avoid the allure of the game. For every week, Torish would go to the basement and perform his tasks. But always, he wondered about the game that was set up in the furthest, deepest room. One chair before it, one mirror to its side, as if the person sitting to play would see themselves as the other combatant. A small square of wood with objects on it, pieces. And the game never ended, but constantly involved positioning, forever positioning. Not one piece had been exchanged or taken. Not one. And eventually, this began to bother Torish. It started as only a concern, an interest, but eventually it played on him night and day. The never-ending circling of the pieces, never engaging, never coming to grips. He said to himself, it was an accident. He told himself it was all part of the rich tapestry of life. He told himself later on, it was not his fault. But he swept just that little bit too enthusiastically, bumped the board hard that day, and one of the pieces fell over. Torish looked at the board for minutes, stunned. He looked at his broom, looked at the door, looked at the mirror, and then at the chair. And nothing happened. He half expected the door to fly open and his master to arrive carried upon a summoned thunderhead lightning coruscating from him. But nothing happened. Nothing. So Torish took the piece in his hand. He could not be sure of what it was. At first, he sweated, fearing the rage of his master. But as the time passed, and still nothing happened, he began to bounce the piece in his hand. Then he slammed it down on the board. And he placed it where it could do nothing but be taken the moment that could begin a furious battle for the centre of the board at the beginning of the real fight. As his hand slammed down, the mirror in front of him flashed. A whirlwind of multicoloured blinking lights tumultuously spun in the mirror now, only subsiding when a small slither of pink energy wormed its way out of the mirror and onto the floor. Then the image went dead again, and it went clear and reflective, as if nothing had happened. The small slither of energy now curled up on the floor as Torish looked down, wrapping and folding up into itself. Yet each time a fold fell around it, the hole became larger. It seemed to beat like a heart, and that also made it increase ever so slightly in size with every single beat. Torish kept a hold of the broom with whitening knuckles, as a being opened up like a petal, and arms and legs eventually unfolded. The small pink being then jumped up onto its feet and ran around the room. It giggled as it ran, large, long arms waving above its head. Torish then gave a small shrill squeal and burst off after the thing, for it had pranced to the door, and then literally straight through it. Torish hurled the door open and then crashed after the now running and cartwheeling, giggling pink entity. And wherever the thing bounced, wherever it touched, turned to smoke or gold or silver or water or ashes. The tiles of the floors cracked, the curtains and tapestries burst into flames. And Torish now shouted in panic at each and every one of its new chaotic gifts of pandemonium. Torish caught up to the thing, darting past a particularly explosive burning curtain, but when he grabbed what was at hand and hurled it at the pink thing, the thing at hand was an old axe from a bygone age. 
It turned in the air head over head as it then plunged into the back of the pink thing. The being then instantly fell forward onto its face, ooze coming out of it, but not blood. Tosh looked at the hand that hurled the axe and nodded in surprised self-appreciation. It then stalked towards the slowly melting pink thing. It seemed to dissolve and then run into two patches on the ground. Patches that then started to beat like hearts that folded in on themselves, but each time they did, they became bigger. Torish backed away as he saw this, now witnessing two blue things standing where the pink had fell. But this time, their eyes were red, their gait guarded, their teeth sharper and their claws longer. The two blue things looked at each other morosely. Then their eyebrows furrowed into a look of rage as they both turned their heads in sync and glowered at Torish. The boy then saw them open their mouths wide and snarl before taking their first bounds towards him. Torish ran to the door and passed it, shutting it in swiftly behind him. But of course, as he turned and ran, he saw that the two blue things simply hopped through the door, as had done the pink they were formed from, and they chased him. Up the stairs through the corridors round the tower they chased poor Torish, until finally he got to the highest point of the tower again. As he did, the wizard walked through the door, as Torish had done all those months before. The wizard looked to the boy, to his state, then down to the oncoming horrors. He sighed and waved his hand, and they both exploded, only to reform again into two separate beings of their own, so one had now become four. The wizard did not permit them to complete the process, as the heartbeat and growing began again. He spoke in a language that should not exist, made signs that should not be known by mortal men, and the two things combusted and then blew away on the winds. The wizard then looked to Tarish, who seemed to be trying to make himself as small and unobtrusive as possible. The wizard stepped forward and took the boy's chin in his hand and wrenched his face up to meet his glare. Well, boy... It seems you need more lessons. I did not mean to. Of course you did. It is why I set up that little game. To test you. Some things you obviously cannot learn at the moment. At the least, you stop playing when only one had arrived. Better than any of my other apprentices, said the old man as he let go of the boy even the ones that lived to complete the training. They just massed there, shuffling. Nothing more. Just shuffling around and around. Moaning. Moaning and shuffling, moaning and shuffling. I had honestly near lost control of my functions when they appeared. Thousands upon thousands of them, as far as the eye could see. They crested the horizon, just walking at us. To the walls, to the many levels of defences we had prepared. At first, we were ordered to gun them down. As soon as they hit our range, we unloaded on them again and again and again. They didn't duck. They didn't speed up, didn't hide, didn't stop coming. No matter how many of them we destroyed, they just kept coming. We were ordered to stop firing eventually, when it became obvious we were just making ramps for them. We were in danger of gifting them a carpet of dead to simply walk over our walls if we kept it up. Because they just kept coming. We waited until they got to the very walls. Nobody knew what to expect then. Not us. But definitely not the officers either. They looked down over the walls as speculatively as we did. But nothing happened. Nothing. They got to the walls. They were pushed to the sides by the oncoming throngs. So they just pushed and shuffled around the walls. 
No attempt to climb them. No attempt to climb over each other. No sentience at all. But the numbers. Even if we fired all day, every day, I doubt we'd have dented it even. So many. The dead of a hundred villages, hamlets and towns around us. But they did nothing but shuffle. It was the groaning. I think that is what did it. As more of the things appeared every day, the sound became almost deafening when you put your head anywhere near the side. So many throats flapping open, so many lungs exhaling their pain into the skies. It became so you could always hear them, even in your dreams, even in the city itself, the constant drone of their moaning. Of course, we were not to know. How could we? Because it started in the city, on the walls. One morning, I woke from the dream of moaning, to the reality of its background buzz, of course, only to then hear it below me, besides me, around me. Men and women on the walls, they had turned. Somehow, without even getting inside, these things had turned many. Wrestling and firing and biting and screaming were all around me. Beneath me, I saw the thoroughfares of our city, usually empty of all but resource details scurrying to and fro. But now, they were packed with the same walkers, lurching and moaning until they found living victims and quickly consumed them. We are undone. It was the moaning. The moaning alone. How does one defeat such insidious power? The time. The grim darkness of the far future. The place. The feral world of Kranos IV. They pray. They whimper their pleas unto an uncaring empty sky. There are no sky warriors. There are no chariots of light and thunder. There is no emperor and distant birthplace of humanity. Fairy tales to placate the addled and sheepish. There is only us and them, the dark ones. And no prayers or incantations from our priest will do anything to change that. Nor will I sit behind our walls and await our death. For the survivors, the few, the people who have fled before the onset of this host of evil, they have told me of how it all begins. Always the same, in fire. Our homes are wood, our roofs thatched, our walls stone and timber. But all will burn. If the evil ones are allowed purchase, if they get within range of our homes, it is over. So we go out to meet them. Our lines are solid, our shields locked. Men from not only my village, but a half dozen more. And we do not simply stand, allowing the enemy to rob our warriors of their balls by watching them passively. We move towards the enemy. All are fit, all are whole. All amongst us are carrying their weapons and armor. We jog, making double time toward where they will enter this plateau. The one place we can hold them where our numbers will not be an advantage. And we can get there before them, yet know of their approach. It cannot be ignored, hidden from. They begin to come down the one path towards us. So we form up. Of old we learnt how they are powerful alone, yet too powerful, far too powerful for any one man to defeat, usually. But as a force, as a unit, as one, then many men can defeat them where one could not. We are no army. Long gone are the days when our people were numerous enough to have such luxuries as standing armies. Blights, infestations, poxes and battles long ago. 
crush the peoples of Cranath. We are few. Yet the Hardy survived. Then the evil ones came. Few at first, reaving and burning alone hamlets or homesteads. But as we grew fewer in number over the years, so they became more numerous. Yet we have defeated them before. The cost is high, but it has been done. And today we will do it again. We can hear them screaming as they charge down towards us. We advance to the very mouth of the pathway, and it begins. They come down again and again, each time our spears are sharp, packed, and we hold them off. We push them back on those coming afterwards. They bunch, and when we follow up, many of them fall off the plateau and causeway. Goes well. At times, one of them will get past our shields and spears, amongst the main body and slay many. But the back lines are filled with men as brave as those at the front. We take our hewing axes to them and bear them down. This goes on for hours. Until finally they stop just charging down at us. And they mass. One of them comes out in front of their lines. It screams into the airs and its intent is clear. It is a challenge. Our lines hold but I see my kin and those other villagers all looking to their leaders, their lords. And I see them myself. Old, grizzled, but old. Of all of the head men, I am strongest, fastest. I am the wielder of Hellbane, the Axe of Kings. So I stride out. I am the only one who can. The shield wall opens as I am cheered by all present. I do not wait. I do not walk. I raise Hellblane aloft and issue my challenge and then charge at the beast. The men all ring spear and sword on shield as I run. The thing comes at me also, its loping step the result of its goat-like legs. And at the last it bounds towards me and I launch myself up to meet it. Am I not faint to Huallen? My salmon leap is the envy of all. I am its equal in height as we rush through the air. But I'm not proud of those seconds. If they are that. For I bring down Hellbane and he raises his jagged burning blade. His going sword scythes clean through my axe. And he takes my right arm off. I land. He lands. My arm lands between us. Still clutching Hellbane. Silence. The cheering has stopped. The shields ring no longer. My arm is gone. I move badly, the pain and blood spurting from my now empty right shoulder. But much of it was cauterized by the flames of his blade. The stench of my own burnt flesh reeks. I turn on my heels and lurch. I only barely regain my balance as my foe charges me. I run to my axe, but he is faster. He passes me, and my body lurches forward, propelled to the ground as I now have no legs. The steaming stumps barely below my groin. I do not cry out. I do not whimper. I try. For the men on looking, I try. I use my left arm to try to draw my body to the blade. I will die with it in my hand at least. The thing watches me. It does not laugh. It does not assault me then. It allows me this last honour. My hand closes on the shaft of my axe, just above where my right arm is still clutching it still. I roll onto my back and it is above me. The thing. It nods. It has given me this. Then, and only then, does it raise its blade and cut off my left arm. I now lie limbless and helpless as the demon places its sword in the ground and then stoops down to take my head in its hands. It nods again and smiles. A last signal between warriors. Then everything is flames. As I burn.